And our next speaker is Joanne Rothgarden. Uh, Professor Joanne Rothgarden's research covers the borderlines between ecology, behavior, and evolution. Her research is characterized by creativity and courage, and challenging some of the cornerstones of the way we view nature. In her book, uh, Evolution's Rainbow, Joanne challenged the theory of sexual selection by pointing out the many phenomena which the theory fails to explain. This novel approach was further pursued in her 2009 book, The Genial Gene, where she suggests social selection theory as an alternative to sexual selection. In a nutshell, the theory suggests that cooperation and honesty can better explain behavior compared to the traditional concept of selfish gene competition and deception. Today, Joanne is going to tell us about incentivizing biological cooperation approaches from economic theory of the firm. First of all, I really would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. This has been a, a, a wonderful opportunity to visit Israel. Uh, I spent the last nine days going around Israel, uh, up to, to Galilee, and then down to the Negev Desert for three days. And it's just been astonishing. And uh, if it weren't for this conference, I wouldn't have the opportunity to do that. And of course, I had the opportunity to talk to you all, which is sort of icing on the cake. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I've added a couple slides to this, which hopefully can interface with some of the remarks earlier today. And then just one other thing about me. My own research has been primarily for the first uh, several decades, I blush to say, in population and community ecology. And for the last 12 years, I've been working in behavioral ecology. Now, the first slide that I added right here is to amplify some of the comments that Snaith made about uh, the significance of individualism, or you might say the commonness of methodological individualism in uh, particularly behavioral ecology, as I've now discovered. These quotations right here will illustrate the intensity of the belief in methodological individualism where Parker says, the family is now perceived as a cauldron of conflict all over the place. And McNamara, for example, says, a conflict of interest exists, the parental relationship, with each parent preferring the other to do the hard work. And third, Arnquist says, for example, resolution does not exist to sexual conflict. The problem here is, of course, that methodological individualism is being synonymized with conflict and competition. And so an important question then is whether that, that's actually correct. I greatly enjoyed Lisa's presentation a couple of minutes ago about the evolution of altruism and the stability of altruism in the face of cheaters, relying on a, a multi-level selection argument. I think that the resolution of the problem of the cheater in terms of multi-level selection has been known for some time, and I personally have enjoyed the work of Elon Eschel, whom some of you may know, uh, here in uh, Israel, who made what I felt were the first convincing models for the evolution of altruism under uh, what we now call multi-level selection. Just brilliant work. Now the question is whether or not cheating and altruism and cooperation generally can also occur if you were to adhere to a, an assumption of methodological individualism. Do you need to uh, invoke multi-level selection? Or is a properly worked methodological individualism sufficient to authorize uh, cooperation and altruism? And that's what I wish to explore, uh, using primarily economic-type models. The reason, by the way, for asking whether or not methodological individualism could also underwrite a program of cooperation is that it's not clear how widespread, it's an empirical problem to understand how widespread multi-level selection is. Somebody like David Sloan Wilson sees multi-level selection everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Others are quite unclear about that. And of course, the big problem with the people in England is that they don't see it anywhere. So the reason for pursuing the, the matter of methodological individualism is in case multi-level selection doesn't turn out as common as commonly as one might have hoped. And the approach I've been taking is uh, multi-level in a sense, but not multi-level selection. It's a hybrid between two 
scales. The typical approach in studying the evolution of behavior is to, dating back to Maynard Smith really, is to begin with an account of the evolution of some character, some trait, behavioral trait, in the gene pool, to solve for an equilibrium gene pool configuration and to see what the implications are for the behavior that, are, that is realized. And there's only, this is, I call this a single tier solution concept because all the action is in the evolutionary tier and then you just translate what your evolutionary outcome is to what the animals are doing. The solution concept right here is the so-called evolutionarily stable strategy, which John Maynard Smith introduced, a very important concept. The approach I've been taking and suggest that it might be valuable is instead to start with the behavior, to model behavior as a first class property, and then to embed the model of the behavior into a model of the evolution. You wind up getting evolution shaping the rules of the behavioral game, which you have defined to begin with. One of the advantages this has is that it allows for the multiplicity of solution concepts in if you define a model in the behavioral tier to begin with. One of the interesting ones is called incentive compatibility. And this pertains to a, an area of economics called uh, mecha mechanism design. And that's jargon for the design of a policy mechanism. And an optimal policy mechanism is one in which the different players in the game have no incentive to cheat. A great policy would be one in which the players don't cheat because they have no incentive to do so. So we can consider mechanism design of biological systems using that criterion. Furthermore, in the context of any game, there's the familiar Nash competitive equilibrium where the players play to a point where neither can benefit given what the other's doing. And that's basically the behavioral counterpart of the evolutionary stable strategy. But the late John Nash introduced an additional solution concept called the Nash bargaining solution. And then at about the same time, the 1950s. And this is relatively unknown to biologists, so it's definitely known. And that also can be used for biological purposes. Because if you think about it, there's no reason why the dynamics in the behavioral tier has to mirror the dynamics in the evolutionary tier. The evolutionary tier is admittedly a competitive process in which the outcome represents a zero-sum game between the two genes, between two genes, let's say. If one gene increases, the other goes down, period. No one, there's no way to increase the pie, so to speak. But in the behavioral tier, you can. There's no reason, no a priori reason why you need to imagine that behavior at the individual level mirrors behavior mirrors the dynamics at the genetic level. And that's, in fact, the fallacy that's being done, being done in the two, uh, in, in the quotations I gave you just previously, because they are all people writing from under the supposition that not only is there individualism, but the individualism must be competitive. And it doesn't have to be. So how would this play out? So I'm going to offer you two worked out examples. I've been drawing from the economic theory of the firm. And the, the hypothesis I've been using is that we can look at an animal social group as though it's the biological equivalent of a firm or a company that makes a product. And in particular, the product of a biological social group is offspring. And a profitable biological group you know, produces offspring. Participants in the social group therefore benefit under ordinary natural selection as a result of that. And in the economic literature, there are a lot of models for the organization of companies or firms. And some of these, it seems, might be useful as analogies for us. Here's how it actually works. So this is a case we published some time ago, and it's just a very simple one. But you imagine that you have a genetic variation for the payoffs in a game. This is just an arbitrary game that we work out as an exercise. The A2, if in individuals who are homozygous for A2 playing against other, another individual who's homozygous for A2 is assumed to have this payoff matrix. And conversely, 
A1, A1 homozygotes playing against each other assume to have these payoff matrices. And then, rather tediously, you can uh, make a list, and for those of you who've ever done genetics, this will be very familiar with this, you make a list of all the possible matchups. In this case, it's a homozygote times a home playing against a homozygote. Here's a homozygote playing against a heterozygote. You enumerate them all, you enumerate, then you compute for each one of these how many A1 alleles are produced from these games, and how much from the players in these games, and how many A2 alleles are produced. Add up the column sums, and you thereby compute the gene frequency in the next generation. This is a very tedious way, but a very clear way, to produce an evolutionary model for the change in gene frequency right here. And these are the column sums. Time, and as a result, through time, the gene frequency changes, and the graph of the payoff matrix changes from the red shape to the, to the uh, green shape. This is a workable theoretical program to model the system at the behavioral level. Now what our job is, is to find biologically interesting games that are being played in, in real situations, rather than just an, an arbitrary game, which is what I used here. But that's the theoretical program. The first of the two examples I have pertains to models for the parent-offspring relationship, which is basically the issue of how much food a parent should give an offspring and how much food the offspring should request from the parent. There are two lines of hypothesis for this. One of them is envisions that in the parent-offspring relationship, it's the offspring that control outcome. Most recently, these are called offspring scramble models. And you have this picture that the parent's sitting there, imagine a bird, and all the nestlings are squawking all over the place. And the parent then gives the food to the one who squawks the loudest. And so this is a picture of family life in which there's a lot of sibling competition, and the mother awards uh, the one who competes the most. There's a line who squawks the loudest. The problem with this model and with this whole tradition right here is that it's very inefficient from the parent's point of view to have the kids fighting. The parent who, who allocates according to the sound of the squawking is invasible by a random al allocating parent. The parent who just says, I'm not going to pay attention to all this noise. I'm going to give each of you the same amount or I'm going to give you the full amount randomly. And that's actually more efficient because then the kids stop squealing and they go ahead and get the same amount anyway. In contrast, there's the parental control tradition right here to which I subscribe. And here it's imagined that the parent controls uh, what goes on. And initially this was introduced by Alexander. And then uh, there's a literature in here involving signaling theory, which I adopted part. But here's where our addition is. So we treat this as a two-tier model. So these models are all done in, as in the UK in the single-tier tradition. They try to find the evolutionarily stable strategy for how much signaling occurs between the offspring and the adult. We don't do that. We imagine that the signaling occurs day, day by day. The model we've been using here is the model of a conglomerate. Conglomerate is where there's a parent corporation and there are daughter corporations. And so literally, we have a parent and a daughter. <coughs> the parent, let's say, of McDonald's or some big company, realizes its profit from the profit of its uh, franchises, of its subsidiaries. Here, the parent right here realizes its fitness from the fitness of the offspring. And of course, it, when it goes out and forages, it it uh, incurs risk and risk of mortality. So this has to decide how much to give the offspring. Of course, the offspring wants as much as possible. You envision that what's going on is that there's an auction. An auction, in this case, is that the parent has the capability of setting the price of food. The price of food means how much food she will deliver per unit squawking. And the squawking is expensive for the chick. It costs a lot of energy and time to squawk. The parent can set the price, which is how much it gives for per unit squawking. 
And then the offspring can tell the parent how much they will demand for each level of price. They can see this right here. The chick, for example, has an optimal demand curve. If the price is, happens to be 0.05, this is for a small chick. If the price is 0.05, uh, it'll want this much food. If the price is higher, then it's not going to want that much food. And if the price is still higher, it won't that much. So this is how much food the chick is going to ask for as a function of how expensive it is. And so I'm assuming that this information is conveyed to the parent. And if it is, then the parent, from its point of view, it can figure out what its fitness accumulation rate is as a function of the price it charges. And this would then be the optimal price that it should charge for a small chick, which would be about 0.25 here. And so that would correspond to giving the chick about six units of food. As the chick grows a little bit bigger the next day, it's going to have that curve. And now there'll be a different price and a different result. So day after day, you go through the growing season and see how the chick's demand changes. And at the end of the growing season, you total up what the fitness is. In the behavioral scale models, the behavioral time models, what the individuals are playing for each day is a fitness accumulation amount. So that the fitness used in evolutionary arguments is the generational fitness. But here, we have to build up to the generational fitness by adding up the incremental fitnesses from each day. So each day, they play to maximize their fitness accumulation rate for that day. And the next day, they do it again. The next day, they do it again. And eventually, you wind up with the kind of fitnesses that you plug into a population genetic model for evolutionary change. The other example I've worked out involves what's called nuptial gifts and courtship feeding. Now, the ornithologists tend to call it courtship feeding. The entomologists tend to call them nuptial gifts. Here's a case of a, a red cardinal giving food to a female right here. And the nup and courtship feeding typically takes place from before mating, in the case of birds, from before mating and through mating, and through the, uh, the time that the nest is raised. Now in insects, it also occurs, especially in these katydids, and also in, uh, not in insects, but in spiders as well. I'll show you some data from spiders. Here, the male gives a package of food to the female, and the female consumes the food at the same time that, that the copulation is going on. In this process, you, you can calculate the benefit that each gets from this relationship. Unfortunately, I, don't, I can't find data for the same species on both sides. It happens that there's a a fly here, a scorpion fly, in which on the horizontal axis we have number of salivary masses consumed. So that, that's the amount of nuptial gift that's being given. In the vertical axis here we have number of eggs produced. This is the male's contribution to the female. Number of salivary masses he gives to her, and this is how many eggs he, she lays as a result. Uh, it matters. Now here's the female's contribution to the male. Here, this is the size of the nuptial gift as a function of the duration of copulation. So the bigger the gift, the, the longer the copulation. And this says the longer the copulation, the higher the fertilization rate. So that the female does reward the male uh, in accordance with the size of the gift. So this corresponds to economics, to the so-called principal agent model. The principal agent model refers to the owner of a corporation who is faced with the job of deciding how much to pay his or her employee to make sure that the, the worker's incentive coincides with the owner's incentive. That's why it's called the principal agent. The principal is the owner, the agent is the employee. Now, this would be the, the typical setup of a principal agent model, where the fitness accumulation for the female is equal to the nuptial gift, so she gets the nuptial gift, she gets the courtship fee. Now, I'm making the operational distinction here of the nuptial gift is something being given prior to the mating, and the courtship feeding is what's being given during the mating. 
So the nuptial gift is, in a sense, a pay to play. It's what you pay up front. It's like the signing bonus in athletics. Her fitness is the nuptial gift plus the courtship feeding minus what she has to pay the male and then plus any outside option she has. And meanwhile, the fitness increase for the male is equal to what he's paid by the female minus what it costs him to, to get the food and then minus the cost of the nuptial gift. And so that's all in there. So this winds up being a game in which each player playing with the other. Now, here's where the solution concepts come in. There are several solution concepts. If they play against each other, then this winds up being the equilibrium, the competitive equilibrium point. There's no nuptial gift that's given, and the female gets this much rate, and the male gets this much. But there's a win-win solution possible if they cooperate. And uh, the, the line right here is the so-called efficient frontier. The, the, this line is the Pareto frontier. And this is the Nash bargaining solution. So if the, the size of the nuptial gift happens to be 3 16th, then that's the better solution. So the question is, how can they realize a Nash bargaining solution? So I want to get to the issue here of shared motivation or shared intention. Can they develop shared intention? And I've been hypothesizing that they develop shared intention through physical contact, through physical affiliation. So you see right here all of these animals that are nuzzling one another, grooming each other. And I postulate that through the sharing of reciprocal pleasure, they uh, develop a shared intention. And I have uh, just put in these slides right here to show a case where this involves sexuality. These are lions in the Serengeti. And these were taken by a, a photographer who gave me these uh, prints. From, he's a Brazilian. And these are two male lions. You can see their, their manes here. And they approach each other. They nuzzle each other. And then one solicits the other. And the other one comes and mates it. Like that. So that's uh, what I think is uh, the mechanism by which uh, the Nash bargaining solution is attained. It's attained through realizing a shared intention or a common intention that through physical affiliative contact. And then this then is a brief table of lots of kinds of models from economics that can be used. And I won't go through them all other than just to say that there's a whole shopping list, if you will, of models. The problem with all of them is that they don't have kinship in them. So we could add, add that to them. These are pictures of uh, my book, Evolution's Rainbow, which has just come out in the 10th anniversary edition and is printed in Korean and Portuguese. The genial gene is now in, uh, in French. And in the ultimate self-indulgence, my latest book is a novel <laughs> the, called Ram, Ram 2050. It's a retelling of the Indian epic, the Ramayana, set in the year 2050. And I'll leave with this slide, which is the endorsements from lots of people you may know of, uh, biologists and philosophers and so forth. So thank you so much. I'm going to go over to much. Thank you very much.